I was just saturated with the whole thing all the time. Are you, know, you still all, you are you know. still into vinyl? I don't <laughs> it's simple. I have a case. It's filled with hundreds of postcards. On the back of each postcard, I've written topics. We pull these cards at random, and then we talk. One time I heard an interview with uh, you know, John Cleese talking about how, how, what Monty Python did when they, would, when they would write. They would all get together and just spend hours at a time figuring out new creative ways to procrastinate doing absolutely anything. And, and so uh, I'd say in, in some ways I'm doing that, yet not. Like, I mean, really, I'm just, if I'm home from the road, I'll get up and think, oh, wow, there's 10 things I need to do today. So uh, first thing I should do is play the guitar. I'll end up playing three instruments for, for two hours or something. Yes, it's practicing, but it, it, it's probably just putting off, you know, doing the errand I really need to do. I'm not like Andy. Like, I don't really practice. I usually uh, get up and the first thing I do uh, is make coffee, uh, feed my cat. Um, many yeah, times without feeding the yeah. cat, that, that, that happens before practicing. They'll, yeah. wait, they'll wake me up and, uh, and a lot of times my wife will get, most times my wife will get up first because she goes to work. She has, has a, you know, a real job as opposed to the job I have, which is a real job, but it's a, you know, job, it's a job that you love, so it doesn't seem like work somehow. A lot of cats in this band, huh? Yeah, the cats are... Uh, Central to you know keeping the routine together. Well, this card, this Playa del Carmen card, uh, the topic is it, 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 and I want to know when you guys like as a band, when did you guys realize that you had found it? Maybe that's your sound. Maybe that's the idea that you're going to be a band. Kind of right away, I think, um, only because Andy had a bunch of jam sessions at his house, and people came in and out, and eventually the people that were left standing, so to speak, were the band, and then we added Carrie and a bass player. You know, we realized we had something cool going on, and we went in to a recording studio and uh, just to, you know, throw some stuff down uh, as a document, you know, and uh, that's what wound up in Craig Ferguson's hands, I believe, the, pr the promoter for the Telluride, and he basically was like, ooh, I like that, why don't we have him come out and play the festival? And it was like, uh-oh, I guess we're a band now, and uh, we better, uh, uh, probably should record some more songs and maybe make have a record. And so we like quickly, as fast as we possibly could, made a, a CD so that we had something to sell at Telluride. <laughs> you know, horror of all horrors, we we actually got a gig right away. So I mean, usually you sit there and go, oh, we'll play around home and we got a really going. good gig. Right? You know, we 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 got the we. Got a gig at the Telluride Bluegrass at, you know, festival. So Main stage, without even, so we didn't have we to get the equipment together. together. Normally, you're like, hey, we'll just stay around home, throw the stuff in the station wagon, and after a while, we'll go on the road. Like, we had to go on the road right away, so we had to get a van and a trailer and all that stuff. Yeah. And drive it all the way out to Colorado? And figure yeah, out, yeah, right, you know, get a clean shot van, when you didn't know, do a gig in between. We drove it right to Colorado. Yeah, you know, we picked up our sound man, Mike Partridge, on the way there. And we never even met him. We were just like, here's what he looks like. We met him in St. Louis. Who is this? Mike Partridge, our sound man, who's still our sound man. To this day, it's still your sound man. You hadn't met him, and you picked him up in St. Louis at on the, the way to Telluride. At curbside at the, air, at the airport. How did you know what you were getting? Uh, Leap of Faith. How was that gig? That was I, amazing. Did was you awesome. guys crush it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah it was amazing. It. And so you get off stage, and you've just played Telluride, and you've played well. What do you guys say to each other? Well, not a lot because you're at you know nine or ten thousand feet. Yeah, you kind of you kind of stare off into space blankly and go, "Is there any water around here?" Yeah. Carrie, our drummer, he all of a sudden I f felt the beat get a little wobbly, and I turn around and he's playing with one hand while like the stage uh, manager is strapping an oxygen mask on his face while he's playing. Really? Yeah. This card is siblings. Now uh, you guys are sort of a, a brotherhood as a band. And you spend a lot of time together, but talk to me about brothers, sisters. What's your family like? Big families. Both of us come from big families. Uh, I'm a, I'm Italian, big Italian family. I have uh, four brothers and one sister. Um, so obviously we're Catholics. Yeah, I got six brothers and two sisters. Bigger. Six brothers, two sisters. So you're there. Oh my, there's nine of you. Yeah. And what? then then the other you know the other three or four kids that are just living there for no apparent reason. Just people from the street. Yeah, <laughs> growing up. Yeah, his, uh, his, his house was t totally like that. It's like, might as well have been a commune. 
Were, were they musical houses? Uh, my house was, in in a sense, bec uh, my older two of my older brothers um, played in bands. I don't know that I'd be a, a, mus a professional musician had it not been for me being exposed to his, you know, life in that way. Cause it kind of it kind of led me in this direction. What was the first instrument? Drums, amazingly. In my neighborhood, the fire department had uh, in Long Island. The fire departments had uh, drum and bugle corps, and they had these competitions, and they had like junior drum and bugle corps. So even when I was, uh, I think I joined the drum and bugle corps when I was like seven. I was just a little teeny kid, and they they gave you a little snare drum, and they they had a guy that was a drum master that would teach you, and I learned all of the rudiments and stuff like that. Uh, I, I got a clarinet. I started on woodwinds. And I tried playing guitar because he had one laying around, but I just didn't, I couldn't understand the guitar initially. Like I, I started on mandolin, really, and, and my mom had a zither in the attic. A that, what? It's a, a zither. It's a, it's a German instrument. It was an antique instrument. Huh. Are there going to be any zither songs coming into the uh, Railroad Earth repertoire? Maybe. Uh, maybe, yeah. I just, got, I just got one with a pickup. Really? Do you have it on this tour? I, you know, I... I we flew again, and I couldn't. I didn't bring it on the tour. But one of the one of the great uh, film noir uh, movies of all time, uh, the, the Third Man, is that whole is uh, that whole soundtrack is zither. That's all zither. That all that music. What's his name? The guy, the famous dude. The, the guy who plays his name Anton Karras, but yeah. Orson Welles was in the movie. Okay. Yeah. So it's a, it's from the 1952. The the style that that I play in it, and he's talking about in this movie, is really a, more like a gypsy style that kind of fell by the wayside because of the Iron Curtain that got cut off with, you know, communism. Like, e like Eastern Germany is where this other style is from that's more of a romantic gypsy style, not polka at all. It's, it's a this is crazy. I'm going to spend the rest of my day watching zither videos. The, it, I'll tell you what, it's a really, uh, it's a beautiful, enigmatic... Uh, tone for an instrument. It's just it's woody and rings at the same time. It has it has a keyboard like element to it. Um, it's hard to describe, but uh, there isn't anything exactly like it. I can tell you that much. On the on the subject of siblings, it's it's probably worthwhile to point out that Andy and I are um, probably more connected than any brothers that you would you would probably know. Because Andy and I have actually been playing music together for 38 years. 38 years? 38 years. How'd you guys hook up? Uh, I joined his band when I was 21. What kind of band was it? It was a band called the Blue Sparks from Hell. We toured hardcore for uh, 15 years. We did 250 gigs a year for 15 years. And that band did over 4,000 gigs. To give you an idea, Fish has yet to do more than 1,700 gigs. Or even Railroad Earth or String She's Incident. None of those, <laughs> not, not a single one of those, these bands that I just mentioned, or Widespread Panic for that matter, have, have broken the 2,000 gigs. That's incredible. The first record that I uh, bought of his was, was uh, I had um, when I was a kid, was uh, Hunky Dory. I had. Uh, Ziggy Stardust and Spiders from Mars, and um, and I had Low. Those are the three records that I actually own. The, the, those are the Bowie records that I have in my my LP collection that I've had since I was you know that I've always had. Um, but those are pretty unbelievable records. And I wound up actually later on in in life uh, as producing records. I wound up working on a number of records with the, this guy named Phil Niccolo, who was a producer in his own right, but he, he, um, he was the, uh, one of the engineers on Low, the record Low. And uh, he, told, he tells some great Bowie stories. Like he, you know, the first record that he did with him, he, uh, he thought, well, he was good, they were mixing, right? And he thought like, you know, got an artist like David Bowie seems to be super meticulous, and probably he is obviously, but in the mixing process, probably not so much because there's a lot of, you know, tweaking and a lot of sitting around and listening to things over and over again and so th they got through about halfway through mixing the first song and Bowie got up put his long coat on he's like all right well you know I'm gonna leave now I said what you don't leave we're just we're just getting sorted no look just turn up the good shit 
and turned down the bad shit. <laughs> and then he left. <laughs> It's kind of a great philosophy for life, right? Just turn up the good, good shit, shit, turn, turn down, down the bad, bad shit, and then, you know, just carry on. Yeah, right, exactly. What about you? Was Bowie uh, important for you at all? I, I guess I just paraphrase what Tom Waits said about Johnny Cash. Like, when, when David Bowie comes on the radio, nobody changes the dial. You know, I mean, I, I, always, I always like what he did. I wasn't a super fan or so much buying records and stuff. And plus, I'd go back to the sibling thing, which is, in our house... There was the stereo was on 24 hours a day, and everybody had in the house had a different record collection. So, my brother would put on everything from, you know, Bowie down to what Bowie listened to, like experimental, you know, French composers and stuff. So that was on some of the day, and I'd hear that. And my, my sister come home, and she'd put on something. So I mean, I didn't need to be a fan so much as I it was. I was just saturated with the whole thing all the time. Are you, you know, still all, you are you know, still into vinyl? I don't. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, forgot I was plugged in. Plug me in again, Lee. Still into vinyls? Funny you should mention that. We didn't even know that we were like usually we stay in another hotel when we come to Atlanta, and they put us in this hotel here. And at first, I was like, "Oh man, I didn't know where it was or anything is, you know, where anything was." Or, and so, of course, right up in the corner is a great little record store. So, what did we get? I got the first Blood, Sweat, and Tears. In really good shape, which is really the, the best I, the best one. Can I just say, by the way, that's the creepiest album cover I've ever seen. Isn't it? It's totally creepy. That's Al Cooper, and that's he was only on the in the band for this record. And um, and the, the record's brilliant. And I, I used to have Can it. Get a shot of that album cover. That's gonna haunt me in my dreams. It's yeah. it's pretty creepy, but it's a really really great record. Okay. And then of course, I had to have. Nancy and Lee, this is Nancy Sinatra and Lee Hazelwood, who is a um, one of one of my producer heroes. Okay. That's it. Getting a little bit better there. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. All right. And uh, I have no idea. Like I, I have never heard this record. <laughs> so look at the look at them. <laughs> Can I just say that in both the front picture and in the back picture. Uh, Lee looks incredibly guilty of something. <laughs> he does look good. <laughs> That's exactly yeah. right. He what, does. Do you think he, what do you think he did? What's his face say? Yeah. It's, uh, uh, I ate the cookies. <laughs> I, 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 ate the, I ate the cookies. So, I mean, I'm t I can't wait it, to listen to it this. It looks more sinister to me, like, wait, wait, I sold wait. the cat. Yeah, you know? wait till my accountant hears about this. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so for five bucks and ten bucks for the... The blood, sweat, and tears. I'm going to have a, a great little listening experience when I get home. So you're still in the vinyl. Is the I'm still in the vinyl. I have my turntable set up right yeah. now. I just I, I just bought three records on the last tour too. I I love I love I love it. I lo I'm, as a matter of fact, I don't buy CDs anymore. I buy I just buy vinyl. Even new records, I just I spend the money and I buy vinyl. You were voicing kind of a, a an inner band conversation that we've had on and off. I, 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 I don't want to speak for you, but Andy's been one of the proponents of just like, let's just release singles every once in a while, right? Just to yeah, keep it, to, yeah, because just, it's kind of the nature of things now. I'm just putting it more in the context of a touring band where you really are catch as catch can trying to rehearse something and you get this great song and then you're going to wait nine months or whatever, a year to put it out. Like, like let's just, you know, just put a song out. It's history repeating itself, really, because I mean, that's what the... The Beatles had songs that never They're got put singles. on record. They, they, just, they, they just put something on there to get it out there while they were working on the record or something. So it's really, it's like it's not a new thing. And then you go back to the 30s or 40s and all those, I mean, there, there was only the, you can only put a side out at a time. And it sort of lends itself to the new social media world that we live in, which is all of a sudden you can announce oh, on yeah, your social media true. outlets, hey, we just released a new single and all of a sudden you drive immediate traffic to your website where people are now downloading the song from the website or however that works. And, oh, while I'm here, shit, let's see who's, if they're on tour. It's, I mean, most of the fans know when you're coming to town, yeah. but it's kind of an interesting way to keep people coming back to the site. So that's what you should do. We yeah. should create, dig that, you know, create digital artwork that goes with each single. Absolutely. Right. Digital artwork that goes with each single. And, and release a video for the single. Yeah. Hey, I think we have a good idea here. I think we just figured it out.